Hello everyone, I want to welcome you to week 10 of Bioethics 400, Responsible Conduct of Research. Uh, as always, just to sort of orient you, uh, what we're talking about in this course are the eight different or concepts of research integrity as defined by the, by the U.S. Office of Research Integrity. And the topic that we're going to be focusing on this week is the topic of scientific misconduct. Uh, it's actually kind of a, a fun and interesting topic. Um, and surprisingly, um, many of the scientists that we now sort of uh, laud or esteem um, are likely to have engaged in what would now be considered scientific misconduct. In fact, throughout the history of science, there have been many claims that scientists, uh, including famous scientists, have fudged data in ways that would, would be considered misconduct under current uh, regulations and definitions of scientific misconduct. For example, uh, we know from examining uh, the notebooks of Gregor Mendel that his uh, results with pea plants were a lot cleaner than what was observed experimentally, indicating that he might have changed or omitted some of his data in order to better support his hypothesis around uh, uh, genetic inheritance of alleles. Similarly, in physics, Robert Millikan, in a research paper describing the charge of an electron, failed to mention that he eliminated some of the data points that didn't support his, his hypothesis or conclusions. Now, he probably should have reported why he removed those data in the publication, but the fact that he didn't would now probably be considered a form of scientific misconduct. Now, how do we define scientific misconduct? Well, scientific misconduct is defined by uh, the agencies or organizations that fund research in different ways. And in fact, they, the funders of research, are often the ones that establish what both the definition of scientific misconduct as well as the penalties are. Although you will see professional organizations, et cetera, also come up with their own definitions. Now, the U.S. National Institutes of Health, which funds the largest amount of um, uh, publicly funded research both in the United States and globally defines uh, scientific misconduct as any action that willfully compromises the integrity of scientific research in proposing, performing, and reviewing research or in reporting research results. Other organizations such as the National Science Foundation, uh, Department of Defense, etc. have a similar definition although it may vary slightly. In general, however, in the United States, at least, scientific misconduct is largely seen as being fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism in proposing, performing, reviewing, or reporting research. So what are each of those three categories? Well, fabrication is pretty straightforward. It's the making up of data or results and recording and reporting them. Now, falsification is different. Falsification is manipulating research materials, equipment, or processes, or changing or omitting data or results such that the research is not accurately represented in the research record. Now, when you consider issues of falsification, it is important to consider what to do with data outliers. Now, we talked a little bit about data outliers in the unit on data acquisition and management, but what is an outlier? But although definitions vary, an outlier is generally considered to be a data point that is far outside the norm for a variable or a population. Outliers are often caused by human error, such as errors in data collection, recording, or entry, but they may also be the result of sampling errors. In social science research, for example, particularly research that involves interviews around sensitive topics like sexual behavior or drug and alcohol abuse, you might find that some survey respondents will deliberately underestimate uh, the uh, number of sexual partners they've had uh, or uh, the amount of alcohol uh, that they consume in an average week. Um, similarly, um, you might see a, a skewing if you're doing research on socially desirable behavior, such as uh, uh, having people self-report about income or how frequently they attend church. And so sometimes you can get data points that, far, that uh, lay far outside the normal distribution of what you see. And so you have to make decisions about how to handle those data outliers. So data outliers are a nuisance, they're an error, but sometimes they are legitimate data. So it's important, as we talked about in the uh, earlier module on data acquisition, to have a plan for how to deal with data outliers uh, from the beginning. Uh, it's also important to make sure that you report how all of these uh, uh, data outliers have been handled. Um, 
And uh, just to remind you guys that data outliers can actually be an inspiration for inquiry because when you have an interesting data point that far lays far outside your expected range, it might actually be uh, an interesting observation or discovery that could lead to the generation of a new hypothesis or actually challenge uh, existing hypotheses or theories. Now, plagiarism is, um, as you guys are probably very familiar with, uh, the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. Now, plagiarism cases have been increasingly easy to identify, in part because of software tools such as Turnitin and iAuthenticate. Increasingly common, however, are allegations of image manipulations, such as falsely labeling the protein bands on a gel, which can also be quickly identified with software. Okay. Now, there is uh, as well concerns around a topic known as self-plagiarism, that is the idea of not properly giving your, yourself uh, credit uh, if, for example, uh, you are writing uh, a paper uh, that is a follow-up on research that you did in uh, months or years prior uh, and you repeat some of the data without citing your earlier work or you you use the same turns of phrase that you wrote in the the earlier article without properly citing the the other work now self plagiarism is one of those ephemeral concepts um, I actually don't consider it to be a big issue I think it's been largely brought up by the publishing industry that's um, worried about violations of copyright more so than they are worried about concerns about scientific misconduct um, and I I, I find that um, it's difficult to argue that someone self plagiarized even when a turn of phrase or a sentence is very similar to what they've written before because all of us have particular styles of writing and all of us particularly when we're writing background or introduction sections uh, there's only so many ways that you can say a phrase like HIV is the virus that causes AIDS so it's difficult to actually make a strong argument that self-plagiarism is a serious problem. Uh, the, only the most egregious cases, that is where someone actually uh, purposely reuses data uh, from an earlier paper and thus engages in things like uh, redundant publication or salami science, that would be an example of where self-plagiarism might be an issue. Now, even with a clear definition of scientific misconduct, gray areas can still arise. For example, cherry-picking statistical methods to obtain desired results or omitting outlier points on a graph can fall under the rubric of honest different in the interpretation of results uh, or in misconduct. For example, evolutionary biologist Mark Hauser resigned from Harvard a few years ago after he was found solely responsible for eight instances of scientific misconduct, most notably in a paper showing that cotton top uh, tamarind monkeys could learn simple rule-like patterns. Now the paper was retracted in, re um, in part because a former trainee of Hauser's, who prefers to remain anonymous, did not agree with the final findings of the, the investigation. Now, Others, have, however, have argued that um, Hauser might have overlooked or favorably interpreted some of his data, but um, would be surprised if the data themselves had been intentionally uh, uh, fabricated falsif or falsified, that is, that they had been intentionally changed. Now, several of the experiments in question have since been replicated by Hauser and his colleagues, and the results published again, highlighting the really fine line between a lack of data integrity and misconduct. So, let's consider uh, an actual case example. Okay, so um, part of the let's say that part of the data collection methodology for uh, Mr. Smith's study involves distributing a 12-page self-administered questionnaire to participants. They must fill out an initial each page of the questionnaire in order to confirm completion. One day on his way home from conducting an interview with a subject, a research assistant, Joel, needed to write directions for a friend, and he reached into his bag and grabbed the first piece of paper that he could find. And so accidentally, Joel ripped off the back page of one of the completed questionnaires in order to write these directions down, which he then gave to a friend. He didn't realize this until a few hours later when he was reviewing the data that he collected that day. 
Now, Joel thought he remembered the participants' answers on the last page of the survey, since they were mostly demographic questions, so he stapled on a new page and filled out the subject's responses, since he remembered them. Now, was this fabrication? Was this falsification? What should Joel have done? Well, and the answer is that Joel should have uh, omitted the participants' entire questionnaire from the study because their par partial data was invalid, and he was fabricating data because he was making up results and reporting them. The fact that he thought he remembered what the results were does not necessarily mean that his actions were appropriate. Now, again, I want to remind you that not all um, deviations from accepted scientific practices constitute scientific misconduct. Some might even be justified, particularly when you're doing cutting-edge research, uh, you're using new statistical methods or approaches. As long as you can justify and explain your rationale to a scientific audience. As an example, I did, uh, back when I had my research lab at the New York State Department of Health, um, I did a study that looked at the effect of genetic alleles on um, acquisition of HIV uh, to, by babies born to HIV-positive mothers. And one of the things that we found was that there was a, an allele, Delta 32, that was partially protective. That is, that kids uh, who uh, were um, carried it, uh, at least one copy of the Delta 32 allele uh, seemed to be less likely to acquire HIV when born to an HIV-infected mother. Now, we were the first study and the largest study to actually demonstrate that association. Um, earlier studies had simply used a statistical method where they predicted the number of kids that were born um, with um, HIV uh, and compared it to the, the distribution of the Delta 32 allele in that population. And they didn't find that there was any effect. However, we took a different approach in part because the Delta 32 allele is known to be protective in adults, and so there would be a less likely chance that an HIV-infected mother herself would carry the Delta 32 allele, so it was already going to skew the, the likelihood that that allele would appear uh, in children born to an HIV-positive mother. That is, that she'd be less likely to have the Delta 32 allele so most of the Delta 32 alleles, if, if they were inherited by the child, would come from the father. And so recognizing this and recognizing the inherent bias in using a simple, say, 2 by 3 contingency uh, table, we instead uh, used a statistical method derived from population biology and demonstrated that the population of children without HIV had actually been pushed out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. That is, the distribution of the Delta 32 allele in that population was greater than sh it should have been, suggesting that there was some sort of selective pressure, and that selective pressure, we argued, was exposure to HIV. So. Um, that is an example of how we deviated from accepted scientific practice in terms of the statistical method that we used, but it was scientifically justified. Finally, scientific misconduct does not include honest error, disagreement based on differences of opinion, authorship disputes, or sloppy science. So this is, uh, if you recall from earlier in the course when we talked about the case of Teresa Imanishikari, this is where um, the investigators and Tufts University actually really struggled with that case because she was an incredibly sloppy researcher. Now, I have made the argument um, uh, in the lectures that I gave you, but also in papers I've published elsewhere, that sloppy science itself is a form of scientific misconduct. However, not everyone agrees with me, and rather than it being seen as, as scientific misconduct to the level of requiring sanction, Instead, it is usually just seen as, as inappropriate behavior, and largely uh, uh, it, investigators who are accused of sloppy science are largely uh, given a, uh, a warning rather than any punishments in the case of misconduct. Now, um, so what are some examples of scientific misconduct? Well, the most common examples um, are uh, misrepresenting data in publications, failure to explain weaknesses in data, selective reporting of results, wasteful or duplicative publication, reporting uh, results of a study with power with low power as negative, misuse of funds, uh, provision of honorary authorship, and conflicts of interest. So these are all different examples of things that don't necessarily fall under the rubric of fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism, 
uh, but which nevertheless are considered to be serious deviations uh, from established research practices. Now, um, there are also additional examples that are unique to research involving human participants that we'll explore uh, in weeks 13 and 14 of this course. Uh, some of these include things like um, uh, failure to obtain IRB approval or exemption prior to the start of a study, that is, doing research with human participants without actually following the, the regulatory requirements for review by an independent ethics committee. Uh, intentional violation of acceptable procedures related to subject recruitment, uh, such as coercion or deliberately deceiving people in order to get them to enroll in the study. Uh, safety violations, so not taking the appropriate precautions to prevent uh, uh, risk or harm to participants. Uh, failure to obtain IRB approval when in initiating a protocol change, except when it's absolutely necessary to protect participants from imminent harm and failure to inform the IRB of protocol deviations. Now, some of these may seem very uh, familiar because they, uh, they are related to a case study that we did a few weeks ago uh, in the Conflict of Interest Unit where we were looking at the conflicts that a researcher had uh, in the um, uh, uh, recruitment of subjects for an, a drug study and his failure to report those conflicts of interest uh, to the IRB. Uh, we'll loop back to cases like that a little later in the course. Now, now that said, um, I want to propose a couple questions to you. Which of the following do you think would be considered scientific misconduct? One, failing to correct the scientific record, that is not allowing uncorrected errors, or sorry, that is allowing uncorrected errors to remain in a peer-reviewed article. So if I discovered, for example, that um, a piece of equipment that I had used for, uh, as a key part of a research study, uh, had actually been uh, miscalibrated so that all of my research results were abnormally high or abnormally low, leading me to come up with an erroneous conclusion. If I had published the findings of that study before I discovered this error in equipment calibration, and I failed to go back to the editor and let the readers know of this mistake, that is, I failed to correct or re retract uh, my previous article, would that be considered scientific misconduct? Okay, what about subjective data uh, uh, selection? I've already sort of touched upon this, but excluding outliers from data sets or manipulating data images, is that scientific misconduct? Is, as I mentioned, self-plagiarism scientific misconduct? And finally, what about if someone is being accused of misconduct? I suspect that they did engage in misconduct, but they're my friend. And so when an investigator, and we'll go over what an investigation of scientific misconduct looks like uh, shortly, but an investigator comes around asking if I uh, suspect um, that the, um, the researcher in question has engaged in scientific misconduct, uh, and I say no, um, is that misconduct, scientific misconduct on my part? And those are all very interesting questions. And the, the answer is some of them may be scientific misconduct um, and others may not. Uh, in the case of sub subjective data selection, for example, it is not misconduct to exclude outliers from data sets so long as you do so in a consistent and pre-thought out way, as we talked about in the module on data acquisition and management, and so long as you make it clear to the reader of your scientific article or anyone else looking at your data that you've excluded the outliers and why you excluded them. So it's about being open and honest about the exclusion of outliers from the data set. So you're not, uh, you're not uh, falsifying your data because you're sharing the information about the existence of outliers and why you specifically excluded them. Similarly, it is acceptable at times to manipulate data images. For example, if you're using electron microscopy uh, and you want to highlight a particular feature of the cell, you can enhance it in order to make it clear to the reader what you want them to focus on. However, what you can't do is manipulate an image and not reveal that the image has been manipulated. Similarly, you can say, take an image of a, um, an SDS page gel uh, and, and highlight, enhance uh, 
that image so that you bring up a faint band. But what you can't do is only enhance that band while you leave the other bands alone uh, so that the band in question seems to be uh, prevalent at a much uh, stronger intensity uh, than would otherwise be correct. Similarly, you must report manipulation of the data images. Um, in fact, many journals uh, nowadays uh, require, if you're submitting digital images uh, that are part of the, the scientific data, that you provide the editors not only with the um, enhanced image, but also a copy of the original image uh, for comparison. We talked already about self-plagiarism. Uh, I don't think it's scientific misconduct in most cases, unless it falls under the example of, of sort of redundant publication. But this issue of impeding an investigation into misconduct by someone else is a challenging one. Um, and it really falls into the category of whether or not you feel that um, it is a violation of accepted research practices. And many of us who work in research ethics do, um, but we also believe that it falls outside the purview and responsibilities of investigators of scientific misconduct and instead falls into the realm of, of criminal or civil misconduct. Um, other examples, people have been accused of scientific misconduct, for example, uh, because they've sexually harassed research students uh, uh, working in their laboratories um, to the point that those students um, uh, you know, were um, conducting research that, that just was of low quality. And some people have said that that's an example of scientific misconduct, whereas others, including myself, believe it's not scientific misconduct per se, but it is inappropriate behavior uh, that should be investigated and punished. Other other statutes such as Title IX. So what happens when you have allegations of misconduct? Well, allegations of misconduct require um, a finding that there was a significant departure from accepted practices of the scientific community, that the action was committed intentionally, knowingly, or in reckless disregard of accepted practices, and requires that the allegation is proven by a preponderance of evidence. That is, that the majority of evidence suggests that misconduct did occur. Um, it does not require, however, the high standards of, say, beyond a reasonable doubt. So preponderance of evidence is actually a specific legal term. That means that 51% of the evidence uh, has to lean in favor of an allegation of scientific misconduct. Now, it doesn't require that an institution realizes that the action represents misconduct. Uh, however, the researcher must have planned to commit the act. So if you accidentally, for example, uh, leave out uh, an important set of data from your analysis, um, that technically would be an example of, fal of uh, falsification in that you're not accurately re, uh, recording data into the research record. However, because you did not knowingly do so, um, uh, uh, it is not considered to be um, misconduct. It is considered to be uh, an error. Okay. Now, what happens when you have an allegation? Well, um, there is an inquiry. Now, these, these inquiries are an assessment of whether or not uh, the allegation has substance and whether or not an investigation of the allegations is warranted. An investigation is the formal development of a factual record and an examination of the record leading to either dismissal of a case or a recommendation for a finding of research misconduct or other remedies. And then finally, there's an adjudication phase in which if there are recommendations uh, for a finding of misconduct, these recommendations are reviewed and corrective actions such as sanctions are uh, determined. Now, in order to determine whether or not misconduct has occurred, again, the action must have been committed intentionally or knowingly and in reckless disregard of known practices. And the allegation must be proven by a preponderance of evidence. Okay? Now, these inquiries require, one, that there's clear documentation. So when making an allegation of scientific misconduct, documentation of who did what when they did it um, and why they did it will provide the best chance for a fair and timely resolution of the allegation. 
Now, there have to also be rules and procedures for, for inquiring or investigating scientific misconduct. And even though the federal government has minimal requirements about how institutions uh, should investigate uh, misconduct, institutions, as you'll see, have some leeway in how they apply the regulations. Okay? There also has to be the concept of perception. What may appear to be a serious uh, uh, action or, or serious scientific misconduct could actually be a misunderstanding, as was the case of Mark Hauser, apparently. And so it might be appropriate for anyone uh, conducting an inquiry or investigation to talk to the peers of the researcher in question, senior researchers in the team, an ombudsman, and even the individual uh, whom has been alleged to engage in scientific misconduct. And then finally, there has to be some aspect of dispute resolution. Some allegations of research misconduct might be resolved through other means, such as conflict resolution. And this involves dealing with a problem as soon as possible and striving for agreement rather than disagreement. Now, any dispute resolution needs to emphasize the problem, not the people involved, and it should use a third party such as an ombudsman or a mediator to clarify issues as necessary. So let's talk a little bit about um, institutional misconduct and policy. Now, as I mentioned, the federal government has some requirements uh, that institutions have in place uh, policies for investigating allegations of scientific misconduct. This is a requirement of all institutions that receive federal funding. And this is true even within the federal government. The NIH, for example, conducts a lot of in-house research, and they can't investigate themselves, so they actually created the U.S. Office of Research Integrity, ORI, the same body that created sort of the definition of responsible conduct of research, the eight topics that we're exploring in this course, they created that as a separate and independent office so that the Office of Research Integrity could investigate allegations of misconduct within the NIH. Now, again, there's leeway, but the policies, um, and the policies may differ in uh, specifics, but they are all constructed with the same ideals in mind. And that is, as soon as someone is involved in an allegation of misconduct, he or she should review institutional procedures on the issue, and particularly whistleblowers need to know who should be apprised of the allegation, what constitutes evidence of, uh, for or against an allegation, how the evidence will be obtained, who will review the allegation, and what the whistleblower's role will be, and how much time the process is expected to take. Now, Agencies generally um, defer to institutions on any allegations of misconduct as well as sanctions that are made. Okay? Occasionally, however, agencies will perform their own inquiries into or investigations of allegations of scientific misconduct, particularly when it involves use of federal funds or in certain circumstances, such as in order to act quickly to protect the public interest, such as when public health or safety are at stake. Now, research institutions also have to um, inform um, an agency or agencies about an inquiry into an allegation of misconduct involving federally funded research if it leads to, that's important, if it leads to sufficient evidence to proceed to an investigation. So remember, there's a couple different steps. You have an initial inquiry to determine whether or not the allegation of scientific misconduct is credible and warrants an investigation, and then you have the investigation itself. And so it's only if um, the person in charge of investigating scientific misconduct at an institution um, during the inquiry phase determines it warrants a formal investigation that the federal agency, um, uh, you know, providing the research funds uh, involved must be informed. Similarly, once an investigation is complete, the institution is also required to forward a copy of the evidence, their investigative report, recommendations made to the institution's adjudicating official, and the, sub, uh, the um, subject of inquiry's written response to the recommendations to the federal agency, assuming that there are these documents. Now, institutions also have to inform the agency about the decision of the adjudicating official and any corrective actions that they take. Finally, if during an inquiry or investigation there is any immediate risk to the public health or safety, all research activities have to be suspended by the institution. 
if there are violations of criminal or civil law or if allegations are made public prematurely, the institution must also notify the federal agency as well as relevant law enforcement agencies. Now, one of the things I want you guys to do this week is to actually look at the um, misconduct policies of Clarkson University and ask yourselves the following questions. Who are the relevant stakeholders involved, um, not only just in the allegation of, of uh, misconduct, but also during the inquiry and the investigation phases? Who should be the investigator? And when should an investigation be initiated? What constitutes enough evidence during an inquiry, for example, to warrant an informal inv a formal investigation of misconduct? How should the subject, um, that is the person at, who's alleged to have engaged in misconduct, be treated during and after the investigation? Uh, this is increasingly important because um, information about allegations of misconduct can become very public, as was the case of Teresa Imanishikari. And even once the investigation ends and that individual is exonerated, for example, of misbehavior, there can be serious repercussions. Same is true in the case of, of Mark Hauser, who was forced to resign um, a, a full professorship from Harvard University. And so there are questions about how suspects are treated both during and after the investigation, and particularly about how um, institutions need to protect uh, both the whistleblower and the person um, who um, is alleged to have engaged in misconduct, um, as well as how to fix any damaged reputations that occur. We also have to consider the types of information and evidence collected, who should have access to that information, the standard of evidence that should be used. As I mentioned, however, um, you are only required to have a preponderance of evidence, that is, the majority of evidence suggests that misconduct occurred in order to be allowed to make a recommendation for sanction. Um, is there a hearing or review process that's conducted? And then what should be the sorts of penalties applied and who are, is informed of the results? Now, again, there are some expectations set by funding agencies like the NIH, particularly around um, uh, uh, information um, informing them of the results uh, when the investigation involves federally funded research. But again, institutions like Clarkson have a lot of leeway. Now, in the US, institutions like Clarkson use largely an adversarial system of investigation. That means, just like in a court, the researcher who is accused of misconduct has a right to defend their actions and also to confront their accusers. Finally, the uh, current laws require that a final report be issued in 180 days. Now, this can be the type of report that is sent to, the, sent to the federal agency when mandated, but even if there is no mandate for federal reporting, uh, current regulations require that once an investigation of scientific misconduct is started by an organization like Clarkson, they have to initial, they have to release a final report in 180 days that includes a description of the allegations, methods used to gather information, summary of the information compiled, statement of the findings, and a description and explanation of any of the penalties imposed. Now, that said, that the fact that a final report has to be issued does not necessarily mean that that is a public report. And depending on the nature of the allegations and the findings, that report can be kept confidential in order to protect the reputation of the researcher or in order to protect um, the reputation of the whistleblower. Now, Finally, um, as I mentioned, the federal government gives a lot of leeway to the institutions, and the institution itself is largely responsible for taking action against any researcher guilty of misconduct. That said, funding agencies like the NIH or the NSF can also impose additional penalties based on the report that they are mandated to receive if, if an investigation involves uh, federally funded research. Um, and they may impose additional penalties that depend on the severity of the misconduct, the intent of the researcher in terms of, of engaging in, in inappropriate behaviors, and whether the misconduct was a singular event or part of a pattern of misbehavior. And so, um, largely, um, the, the additional penalties imposed by organizations like the NSF or the NIH 
are restrictions on applying for research funds, federal research funds, uh, for a known period of time, usually anywhere from two to five years, depending on the nature of the allegation or the severity. And then also, there may be um, additional um, restrictions, for example, that researchers um, cannot um, say um, uh, engage in research without um, appropriate supervision. Now, that said, um, when you look at what the sanctions imposed by institutions are, um, those guilty of misconduct um, can, uh, the sanctions imposed on them can range anywhere from uh, taking appropriate steps to correct the research record, say for an example of an allegation that someone knew a published uh, paper was, um, uh, had erroneous data, um, but um, uh, you know, failed to correct that either through an errata or retraction of the, of the paper. Um, it could uh, include letters of reprimand. Um, it could enclose imposition of new uh, requirements, including certifications to ensure compliance with the terms of, of grants or conducting research involving animals or humans. It could be suspension or termination of research activities, including federally funded grants. And it can even include personal suspension um, or, or um, uh, uh, firing from the institution. Now, again, if criminal or civil fraud violations have also occurred, uh, you may also see an institution referring the findings to the appropriate agencies. Now, um, again, um, when this information is provided to the federal government, uh, the NIH, the NSF can impose additional um, penalties. Even if they don't, however, if there is mandated reporting of misconduct to the U.S. Office of Research Integrity, that office will release the names of people guilty of misconduct publicly on its website um, and um, may suggest additional sanctions or penalties, as I mentioned. So we have the case, for example, a case that I introduced to you in the very first week of this class, Eric Pullman. He was a scientist working in the field of human obesity and aging. And he was the first academic in the United States to actually be jailed for falsifying data in a grant application. His crime was to publish utterly fraudulent research alleging that hormone replacement injections as therapies for menopause uh, were useful when in fact it had no proven medical benefits at all and may have even been harmful in terms of raising a postmenopausal woman's risk of breast and ovarian cancer. Now, he had received 17 grants over the course of his career, and in a plea bargain that he made with federal prosecutors, Eric Pullman pleaded guilty uh, uh, to fraud with one um, uh, half a million dollar grant. And in their indictment, the US prosecutors also stated that Pullman had defrauded agencies out of approximately $3 million. And so in addition to being fired from his institution, he received a $180,000 fine one year in prison and is the first recipient of a lifetime ban on receiving U.S. federal research funds. Now, the next slides just kind of out, lay out um, procedures for responding to allegations of misconduct in research. These are ones um, that are taken from the University of Vermont that I used to work with um, as an outside member of um, their investigatory team. Um, and I don't expect you to to read through these um, and um, look at um, the exact process. I'd rather that you take a little time and look at the process of Clarkson University. But I just want to highlight a couple things. Uh, one is just how rigorous and complex the, uh, the procedures for responding to allegations of misconduct are. Um, I'd also like to point out on this slide, for example, that um, most of the allegations of misconduct are submitted to an individual who's known as the, the RIO, R-I-O, and that stands for Research Integrity Officer. And that is the person that does the initial assessment of the allegation, that is, they do the initial inquiry, and then determine whether or not it warrants um, additional investigation. Now, if it does warrant additional investigation, then you begin to collect evidence of misconduct, including uh, talking with the various actors involved. Um, and it continues through um, a process where the, the research integrity officer convenes an inquiry committee, which usually has one standing member and one sort of ad hoc member. 
uh, with additional members um, and expertise appointed by the research integrity officer uh, for the case. And at that point is when you have written notification uh, to the respondent that an allegation has been made and an effort is made to obtain additional uh, uh, information, including taking custody of any research records uh, that might be relevant. And then there is an, an initial inquiry process that is headed up by the Research Integrity office, uh, Officer unless that officer has to recuse themselves because of potential conflicts of interest or commitment. And the process continues through an initial inquiry report um, and then you actually have the second step of a formal investigation if the initial inquiry determines that formal investigation is warranted. And then you start an entirely new procedure with an investigation committee that is usually a larger committee um, having multiple standing members as well as um, additional outside members um, and experts appointed by the research integrity officer uh, in order to explore the case. And that continues through the investigatory phase until they come up with a detailed investigation report, which is then, uh, which describes the allegations, identifies the respondent, uh, identifies and summarizes the research records and evidence used to come up with their conclusion, describes um, and documents any federal support, that is uh, whether or not this will be required um, mandatory reporting to a federal agency, describes the policy and procedures used, and then has a statement of findings for each allegation. And then that leads into the question of, was there misconduct? And if there was, there's a determination of what the appropriate actions will be. And then both the, um, uh, the, 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 the whistleblower, the complainant, and the respondent are informed. Um, and both of those individuals has the right to file an appeal um, of the final decision. And um, if an appeal is filed, it then goes through an additional process that may even include uh, additional um, application of grievance policies that fall outside of scientific misconduct, but fall rather into things like uh, both the, the uh, faculty and staff uh, uh, you know, uh, employment manuals. And then finally, you move into a decision phase and the institution takes administrative action based on whether or not they have a finding of uh, conduct, misconduct or not. Um, and the, the research integrity officer is again the one that's uh, required to provide written notifications of the results of the inquiry to the relevant uh, stakeholders in the case, the, uh, those including the respondent, the whistleblower, as well as the U.S. Office of Research Integrity and other sponsors as required by law. So that's the process. Um, it's very complex, um, so you can understand why, um, you know, it might take up to 180 days or half a year uh, to have um, a, a formal investigation completed and why the federal government mandates that the reporting be done within that time frame. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, scientific misconduct. Um, we've talked a lot about um, what the investigations uh, are. The penalties of it are uh, severe. Uh, you get public censure, you get loss of grants, restrictions on applying for future grants, loss of employment, etc. So why do people engage in sort of these sorts of behaviors? Well, you probably remember these individuals from um, our previous um, uh, lectures uh, in the beginning of the course. So we have Wang Wu Suk, who is the South Korean cloning expert, who was found to have engaged in misconduct in terms of uh, reporting on successful attempts of um, uh, um, uh, human cloning, uh, that is, um, uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer uh, using um, uh, uh, human uh, eggs. Um, and it was found that in a number of reports, uh, he um, uh, misreported uh, the number of attempts, so overstated uh, the effectiveness and efficiency of his cloning process, um, as well as coerced women in his lab to give him uh, eggs in violation of, of human subjects' um, protections, as well as uh, the expectations of um, his employer. And finally, he was found guilty of mishandling research funds that were provided to him by the South Korean government. 
In the center, we have uh, Jan Heinrich Schoen. Uh, he's actually going to be a case study for us this week, uh, but he was a Bell Labs researcher, uh, German uh, born uh, and trained, uh, but was considered a, a Wundekind uh, when it came to high temperature uh, um, superconducting um, research. Uh, and he was later found to have um, falsified results of 17 papers, including papers published in such top journals as uh, Science and Nature. Um, and in response, he was not only fired, uh, but his, um, the university in which he received his doctoral degree, the University of Constance, actually rescinded that degree, even though he had not been um, uh, alleged to have engaged in misconduct while doing his doctoral research. And then finally, we have the case of William Summerlin. Um, he was the researcher that was doing transplantation research in New York uh, and um, tried to um, falsify his results uh, in terms of transplanting, uh, successfully transplanting skin from black mice to white mice by taking a black Sharpie marker and coloring the fur on the white mice. Now, why did these individuals engage in misconduct? Well, in many cases, it can be driven by, by financial reasons, uh, financial conflicts, um, desire for fame, um, believing that your um, pet hypothesis is correct, even though the, the data is not supporting it, uh, or it can be driven out of things like fear. So in the case of William Summerlin, um, the current um, uh, sort of publish or perish nature of, of, of academic science, where you constantly have to be making the next great advance, your research constantly has to be successful in order for you to receive a promotion, receive tenure, that can lead people to engage in misconduct in order to, to protect themselves personally and professionally. So there's a number of reasons why people engage in scientific misconduct. Now, there are a lot of studies that suggest that scientific misconduct itself is actually quite rare. Um, and um, if you look, for example, at um, the U.S. National Institutes of Health and the Re Office of Research Integrity, uh, that's the independent office that the NIH established to investigate allegations of misconduct, including allegations within the NIH. Over a 10-year period, the um, NIH Office of Research Integrity documented only 200 confirmed cases of misconduct. Uh, and of the investigations that were conducted by the Office of Research Integrity itself uh, in one year, they conducted 23 cases based on allegations of misconduct within the NIH, and misconduct was only confirmed in eight of those cases. And so based on this, the uh, U.S. Office of Research Integrity uh, estimates that less than 1% of all researchers um, engage in or have engaged in scientific misconduct. So, so thus it seems to be quite rare, right? Well, there are others that would argue that scientific misconduct itself is actually quite common. And this is based on a number of studies um, that have been done by independent researchers. So, so one such study done by Halls and Jacobson uh, they surveyed 119 research project administrators, so not the researchers themselves, but the staff members or the institutional officials responsible for overseeing the conduct of research within a particular lab, department, or institution. And in surveys of those research project administrators, Halls and Jacobson found that 27% of them knew of unpublicized cases of misconduct. Similarly, there was a study of, of of scientists that suggest that at least half of them had knowledge of at least one fraudulent research project, um, not necessarily a project that they were engaged in, but that they knew of um, other researchers uh, that had engaged in scientific misconduct. And finally, uh, there was a report by Gardner that found that 17% of published authors in clinical trials reported misrepresentation or fabrication of data um, in, if not in their trial, in other clinical trials that they were involved or aware of. And of those published authors, 1% in this anonymous survey actually um, acknowledged um, uh, personal misconduct. Now, if you actually look at this table, for example, this is taken from a paper by Martins 
Anderson and DeVries. Um, this actually asks um, scientists themselves anonymously whether or not they engaged in any of the behaviors listed below in the past three years. So not just ever, but in the past three years. And what they found was that, well, a very small percentage of, of current investigators actually reported engaging in things like fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of reports of people um, engaging in behaviors that might cons be considered potentially uh, forms of scientific misconduct. Uh, for example, failing to uh, present data that contradict one's own pre previous research. So 6% of all scientists overall uh, state that. Um, and so that's an example of failing to um, essentially correct the scientific record when you have new data that's, that, um, um, support, uh, that, doesn't, that no longer supports uh, previously published conclusion. And in fact, we have right now a situation that's called the, the reproducibility crisis in science. That is, um, it now seems, based on meta-analyses done by folks like John Iwanides and others, um, that approximately one-third of all published scientific studies can't be replicated by uh, independent researchers and other labs. So those breakthrough studies that get published in science and nature um, aren't being replicated. So we have a huge percentage of scientific information and data that's being published out there, uh, suggesting great discoveries, great findings, but then upon further examination, it can't be, can't be reproduced. Now, how many of you, though, recall reading about some great discovery in science and then um, a couple months later uh, seeing a report that completely refutes um, or rejects uh, the initial finding in science? And the answer is you don't because scientific journals don't like to publish flat or negative findings. And so there's considerable problem here, not only that um, researchers aren't um, being honest in their presentation of data and correcting the scientific record when their own theories uh, change or advance, but that they actually fail, um, deliberately fail to present data that contradict their own prior studies uh, out of probably just fear of, of sort of losing their professional reputation. So what are some of the other um, common behaviors that, that are reported um, and that could be constituted um, misconduct? Well, remember how I talked about um, you know, the failure to report or the failure to, or, or even a directly impede uh, investigation of misconduct on, of others? Well, we have 12, over 12 percent, that is one in eight scientists have actually stated that they've overlooked the use of others' flawed data or unquestionable interpretation of data. That is, that they have knowingly just sort of turned a blind eye to potential misconduct by another uh, investigator. And so we have a variety of, of behaviors that are, are considered inappropriate and borderline misconduct that are commonly engaged in by many researchers across the country. Similarly, um, if you look at journal retraction notices, and in fact, there's a great website, Retraction Watch, that I, I encourage you guys look at. Um, if you look at um, the, um, the retraction notices, and in fact, uh, a meta-analysis was done um, of this, um, of those retraction notices, 2% um, of them involve actual fabrication, falsification, um, or plagiarism of, of, of research results. Um, and so it seems like um, the initial report, sort of the initial suggestion that research misconduct is rare, uh, suggested by the fact that the NIH only had uh, 200 confirmed cases of misconduct is actually uh, incorrect. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have a great preponderance of, of misconduct occurring, a lot of it going unreported. So the question I would ask you is, well, why would institutions deliberately underreport misconduct? Or why would they you know, fail to appropriately investigate misconduct, etc.? And the answer should be fairly obvious. It damages the institution's reputation. It can lead to an investigation by federal agencies like the NIH and even suspension of research funds. And it's just bad publicity. So there is an inherent conflict of interest at the institutional level for, uh, for investigators um, 
uh, to be found innocent of misconduct or for allegations of misconduct to be quietly swept away. So if misconduct is so common, when should you actually be suspicious that misconduct is happening? Well, um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the answer is you should be suspicious of when anything that sounds too good to be true um, is, okay? And so anything that sounds too good to be true probably is, and this includes revolutionary findings, consistently perfect results, or misleading statistics. So anytime you're reading an, uh, a research report, or even if you're listening to um, a colleague of yours in a lab meeting reporting results, if they are um, consistently perfect, or if um, the frequency of, of outliers or variants seems to be really, really small, then there are some concerns that they may be inappropriately uh, fabricating or, or falsifying their data. Now, it doesn't mean that, that they are, um, but statistically the likelihood, for example, of having you know, a, 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 line, a, a, a regression uh, value that is exceedingly low um, is very small. Um, science is inherently messy and science is inherently noisy and we as researchers make mistakes, equipment is not properly calibrated, so there should be a lot of variance in our data. That's why we used um, careful statistical methods. So anytime that, that there seem to be really consistent results, it is, it is problematic. Uh, anyone that shows a lack of transparency that is not willing to, to share their findings or results um, or someone that engages in sp suspicious lab practices. There was one case that I personally was involved in investigating. Uh, there was a postdoc that was um, uh, alleged to be falsifying um, their results um, because they were too, too good. And the researcher um, uh, became, became suspicious because the um, postdoc in question um, couldn't find their lab notebooks um, when they were asked for them. Um, and surprisingly, those lab notebooks turned up a couple days later um, and seemed to support um, the findings of, of the postdoc. Uh, something else that made the researcher suspicious was the fact that the postdoc worked very odd hours. Now, that's not unusual for researchers to work long hours in the early morning or into the night, um, but this was uh, a postdoc that was always suspiciously absent from the lab when there were a lot of, of um, uh, students or, or other researchers working um, and seemed to only work very, very late at night and early in the morning when he was the only one in the lab itself. And so there was a suspicion that he was engaging in misconduct uh, and did not want to be observed. And so um, the rather than just make an allegation of misconduct, what the uh, uh, researcher in question did was he asked this postdoc um, to train one of the graduate students and a technician in his techniques uh, and then asked that graduate student and technician to replicate the results uh, and what he found was that uh, they couldn't uh, and so that made him even more suspicious and then he actually asked the uh, postdoc and the uh, to actually demonstrate to him side by side how to get the research findings and surprisingly at that point the postdoc could not um, actually uh, uh, successfully replicate their findings instead their results were consistently flat and so at that point uh, the researcher made an allegation of misconduct that was eventually investigated and found to be true so that's always challenging though, um, which is always easier, being suspicious of someone else's work or being suspicious of someone in your own lab uh, conducting research side by side to you. Um, it's always easier to be suspicious of someone else's work and not be suspicious of the people that are working directly with you uh, or in your own lab. Uh, but what's more important is less to be suspicious of others, but instead to be suspicious or at least vigilant of work that's being done in your own lab by people that you're working with uh, day to day. Now, I want to just close by talking a little bit about whistleblowing. Um, and so um, in 1995, the National Academy of Science um, said that scientists are advised 
that, quote, someone who has witnessed misconduct has an unmistakable obligation to act, unquote. And in fact, most institutions have the same policy. That is, if you see misconduct, you are obligated to report it. Similarly, government regulations require institutions to have, as I mentioned, systems in place so that individuals are able to report misconduct and that they're able to report misconduct confidentially and without retaliation. But even though people who report misrepresentation about research have been turned into heroes in the media and by Hollywood, such as it, uh, the movie The Insider, in which uh, Jeffrey Wiglin disclosed nicotine's addictive properties, um, in reality, uh, most whistleblowers suffer. Um, in fact, according to a 1995 ORI study um, on the consequences of whistleblowing in the scientific community, the willingness of individuals to allege misconduct is likely to depend on how the system deals with and protects them when they come forth with their allegation. Potential whistleblowers must consider uh, whether or not the allegation will be taken seriously and the report treated confidentially, or whether or not the report will provoke retaliation, not only from those accused, but also from the larger academic and scientific community. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, in addition to concerns about retaliation, a lot of people don't engage in whistleblowing because of um, a variety of reasons, and some of it is related to the quotes that I have here. This is actually from a research study that a colleague of mine did where he investigated um, people um, who were um, uh, involved in um, inquiries or investigations about um, uh, scientific misconduct, um, including some of the famous ones that we've already talked about, including uh, you know with Dr. Uh, Jan Heinrich Schoen that we'll explore this week, and Dr. Iman Ishikari. And these were actually some of the findings. So in the case of a researcher at Bell Labs, um, that researcher commented that Dr. Schoen is so well known for his research in superconducting that he must know what he's talking about. So the fact that there were questions about the validity of his science was not um, a su suspicion of misconduct, but rather that Dr. Schoen was so cutting edge in the field that, that um, we just can't understand what he's doing or we can't replicate his results because he's just so much better than we are. Okay? Uh, similarly, you know, there's this, this, these personal biases. I can't believe that Dr. Iman Ishikari is capable of misconduct. I've worked with her for years. But on the other hand, there are these situations in which people say, we all knew he was doing something dodgy. So they didn't report it because it was, it was public knowledge, right? So don't trust the research coming out of this lab because it's always questionable, right? That itself could be considered misconduct because you are helping to contribute to um, the sort of the falsification of the, of the, the research record. Now, I've already mentioned the issue of retaliation. Now, in the U.S., federal laws and state laws protect whistleblowers from retaliation. Now, despite this, whistleblowing nevertheless generates considerable hostility from the people targeted by the whistleblower and by the institution as a gen in general. And this is because uh, the whistleblower is seen as disloyal. Um, so as a, as a trained anthropologist, I often view uh, science um, as a sort of tribe. Um, and you have a situation in which researchers, just like cops will, will protect a dirty cop, researchers tend to protect dirty researchers because they believe that you protect your own. And so a whistleblower is seen as disloyal and acting against the basic instincts of solidarity and mutual protection within the tribe of science. And um, there is concern that the whistleblower is destroying uh, job security, not only um, for the researcher uh, uh, who's being um, uh, investigated, but also for the whistleblower himself. And in fact, the same 1995 Office of Research Integrity study that I mentioned found that more than two-thirds of all whistleblowers have reported experiencing at least one negative outcome as a re direct result of their whistleblowing. These negative experiences have included pressure to drop allegations from the institution, facing counter allegations, being ostracized by their colleagues, reductions in research support levels, threats of being sued, and actually being sued. And some said that they were fired or denied promotions as a result of their reporting uh, suspicions of misconduct. 
Now for the whistleblowers who did not experience a negative consequence as a result of coming forward, 90% of those said that they would do it again. Surprisingly, however, 75% of those that suffered a negative outcome from reporting an allegation of misconduct also said that they would do it again. So whistleblowers have a particular sense of, of ethical responsibility and morality that makes them willing to step forward and make the allegations, even though they are also going to be subject to considerable hostility and actually potentially have their careers damaged. Now, since that original ORI study, there have been better systems put into place in institutions to protect the rights of those that report misconduct. And people who report allegations of misconduct are now protected by rulings from state governments and the federal government including the First Amendment that protects the freedom of speech of anyone that, protect, that reports an allegation of misconduct. We also have the False Claims Act, which protects whistleblowers, and that act was actually originally developed during the Civil War to protect the government from fraudulent contractors. And that actually awards a whistleblower 10 to 30 percent of the resulting settlement in any case of misconduct. So if a whistleblower came forward and was the one that actually blew the whistle on Eric Pullman, the fact that there was a $180,000 criminal settlement in that case, that whistleblower would receive a cut of that settlement. Finally, the False Claims Act also provides for remedies if it can be shown that a whistleblower has suffered discriminatory action in retaliation for the allegations brought under uh, that legislation. Finally, there have been some new federal guidelines proposed by the um, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to further protect whistleblowers, but to date, those have not yet been finalized. So, now you remember the Imanishikari case? Well, the whistleblower in that case was her postdoc, Margaret O'Toole. She had largely, she'd largely been ostracized by the science field, and at one point for employment, she actually ended up answering telephones for moving companies. So a doctoral level researcher who was working um, as a postdoc in one of the top uh, immunology laboratories in the country ended up um, leaving science altogether and at one point had a menial um, sort of minimum wage job uh, to answer uh, telephones uh, as a receptionist. So um, why, why is this an issue? Well, if you think about it, the benefits of whistleblowing are it ensures that the scientific record is correct. That's a benefit to science and society. Uh, it ensures that the, the whistleblower is complying with regulations and policies by, at the institutional as well as the federal level, so you have a benefit to the individual there. Uh, it helps pre uh, prevent future misconduct, so the benefit is to the science and society. It protects reputations, both of the individual whistleblower, and particularly if they uh, are working uh, with um, or in a lab where they believe scientific misconduct has occurred, um, but it can also protect the reputation of others, um, including the institution. So there's a benefit to both the individual as well as to science and society, uh, and then there's the benefit of punishing the wrongdoer. Now, the risks, however, if you notice, are largely all to the whistleblower, in that the allegations will not be borne out, the time and effort and emotion of, of getting involved in, in an investigation is very intensive. Uh, there is what we've already talked about, the potential retaliation by the respondent or the institution, and gaining just overall a reputation as a troublemaker. So why don't people blow the whistle often? Well, that's because if you see all of the risks fall on the whistleblower, despite the fact that we have protections from the First Amendment and the False Claims Act, where the benefits accrue partially to the whistleblower, but more largely to science and society as well as the institution itself. Now, um, I've mentioned retaliation. I've mentioned that we use an adversarial system of investigation. And so one of the things that always has to be considered is what happens when a false allegation is made and how do you, um, uh, you know, protect uh, the individual uh, researcher uh, against whom this allegation has been made and how do you protect the institution and what should be the penalties against someone uh, that makes a false allegation and does does the nature of the false allegation matter whether or not it was knowingly false and malicious or whether or not it was simply uh, a, a misunderstanding or disagreement and so 
those are issues that really haven't been addressed yet within research ethics, but are important ones to consider. Now, why do we care? Why, um, why is, is misconduct so important? Well, that's because misconduct um, threatens not only the integrity and reputation of the researcher, but also that of the institution and of the profession. And in fact, as when misconduct occurs, it really threatens public trust in research and science. And in the case of biomedical research, it can actually threaten the public health. Now, the very fact that misconduct is problematic because it threatens the integrity and reputation of so many individuals is also the reason why these same individuals and institutions are reluctant to report misconduct because they don't want to impugn their own integrity and reputation and they don't want to lose the public trust in research and science. So it's a delicate, delicate balance that they're trying to walk with trying to be transparent and public uh, about any allegations while also trying to maintain that public trust in research and science uh, and ensure that the research endeavor um, remains um, uh, achievable, that funding continues, and that um, the state and, and federal legislators don't start putting into place onerous restrictions and oversight mechanisms that will slow the process of scientific advancement. Finally, why does scientific misconduct occur? I've already kind of alluded to this when I talked about Wen Wu Suk, uh, Jan Heinrich Schoen, and William Summerlin, but there are a number of reasons why researchers have engaged in misconduct, the most common ones being promotion and tenure pressures as well as competition and ego. A less common are conflicts of interest such as financial and non-financial conflicts of interest. Um, Often, even when there's a conflict of interest and there's the suspicion that something untoward has occurred, such as manipulation of research results or, or cherry picking of statistical methods, sometimes um, you know, a finding of scientific misconduct is not found because um, those researchers, um, as a result of their conflicts of interest, may have unknowingly uh, biased or manipulated their data but again, the intent wasn't there. They have to knowingly do something um, in order for it to be considered to be misconduct. And that standard is often not met in those cases. And finally, in extreme, extremely rare cases, you might have problems where researchers are actually have psychiatric illnesses that lead them to engage in inappropriate behaviors. Uh, but again, that's quite rare. So that is pretty much it for our overview of scientific misconduct. Uh, so I want to encourage you to uh, read the assigned um, uh, materials for this week carefully, uh, and then in the discussion forums we'll be exploring uh, very specific cases of scientific uh, misconduct or allegations of scientific misconduct and how they were handled. So I look forward to seeing you guys all online this week.